I was with uh, some couples uh, recently that were asking me to show them how to speak giraffe in couples relationship. And uh, one of the women said to her husband, I want you to understand me. He says, I do understand. She says, no, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. <laughs> Fifteen years they had had <laughs> that dialogue. Words are windows or their walls. They sentence us or set us free. When I speak and when I hear, let the love light shine through me. It always seems funny for me to introduce myself as a giraffe teacher because a giraffe is not my mother tongue. Uh, my mother tongue is the language of jackal. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard jackal spoken. I hope not because it's a, it's a language that I believe is the, at the root of violence throughout the planet because People who are taught this language of jackal have a difficult time resolving differences with other people peacefully, and people who are taught this language have difficulty sharing resources in a fair and equitable manner. So I hope that they have outlawed uh, this language in Denmark, so that you've never heard it, but just in case you ever come across it, I'd like you to at least be aware of what I mean by the language of jackal. Let's assume tonight that you are the stu my students and I give you a task to do, but instead of doing the task, you sit at your chair drawing a picture of me with a knife in my back and blood spurting out. Now, how do I evaluate you if I am a jackal-speaking person? You're mentally disturbed. See, this is typical of the language of jackal. When you have a difference with somebody and you don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, you think of what's wrong with them. So when you are a jackal-speaking person, you have a very large vocabulary for judging who is what. Or let's say tonight if I use some words that you don't understand. You're a slow learner. But what if you use some words that I don't understand? You're rude and socially inappropriate. <laughs> what if I speak so rapidly you can't follow me? You have an auditory problem. <laughs> what if you speak so rapidly I can't follow you? You have an articulation problem. <laughs> See what a language this is. What a violent language it is that when there is a difference you think in terms of what's wrong with the other person. The psychiatrist Gerald Jampolsky says that as human beings, we have a major decision to make each moment. Do we want to be right or do we want to be happy? You can't do both. Jackal is the language of those who want to be right. Because if the whole time you're taught to think and communicate in jackal, you are always up in your head analyzing who is what. Who's right, who's wrong, who's normal, who's abnormal. Now why did I shift from speaking jackal to learning a new language? Well, I found that this language that I had been taught was not one that made it easy to live in harmony with my values. There are certain things that I value very dearly, and I found that this language got in the way. Instead of helping me live in harmony with my values, it interfered. So what are the values that led me to search for another language? Uh, I'd like to clarify the, the, the values upon which the language of giraffe is based with a song written by a woman in the United States who studied giraffe with me for a while and wrote this song to clarify the quality of relationships that I value highly, that 
I developed Giraffe to help me live in harmony with. This is a song called Given To. I never feel more given to than when you take from me. When you understand the joy I feel giving to you. You know my giving isn't done to put you in my debt. But because I want to live the love I feel for you to receive with grace may be the greatest giving there's no way I can separate the two when you give to me I give you my receiving and when you take from me I feel so given to I'm interested in that quality of relationship I'm interested in how we can give and receive in that way in the family in the workplace and politically I think it's not only possible for us to do business that way I think it's our natural state. I think we are intended as a species to relate that way. So I have been interested in the people who are able not only to believe in that quality of connecting between human beings, where people do things purposely to enrich one another's well-being. They don't motivate through fear, guilt, or shame. They motivate one another simply being aware that the natural state of human beings is to willingly enrich the life of one another. So I've been interested in the people who live that way, and studying them is when I came across this language of giraffe. I noticed that people who were living in harmony with the kind of values that I described spoke a language that's quite different than the language that I was brought up to speak. And I studied this language and I tried to learn it myself. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I have now been teaching this language for several years. Technically, I call it a process of nonviolent communication. But as you can see this evening, I like to play with this little image of calling it giraffe language. And I like giraffe is a symbol for the, this process of communication for several reasons. As we'll see tonight, giraffe is a language of the heart. It redefines honesty. You see, in, when we are jackal-speaking people, when we say we're honest, what we mean is we tell other people what's wrong with them. <coughs> giraffe defines honesty in quite a different way, as we will see. When we are honest in giraffe, we are honest from the heart. We have a way of openly revealing what's going on within ourselves without in any way using language that criticizes, diagnoses, judges, interprets, or attacks others. This will be a theme I'll return to several times this evening, that any time another person hears anything coming from our mouths, that sounds like a criticism, or a judgment, or an analysis, or a diagnosis, the likelihood that we can get our needs met is almost zero. Because when people hear any language that sounds that way to them, most of their energy goes into defending themselves or counterattacking. And even if they do what we want, if we get them to do it because we have judged them and criticized them, they are likely to do what we are asking, motivated by fear, guilt, or shame. And the second reason why I like the image of the giraffe is the giraffe can see into the future better than other animals because of its height. And it can see that any time people do what we ask, motivated by fear, guilt or shame, we lose 
we lose even when the other person does what we ask them to do. Because when people are motivated by fear, guilt, or shame, it creates very destructive ecological consequences. I grew up speaking a, a rather harsh dialect of jackal. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan in the United States. And there I spoke a dialect of jackal called street jackal. For example, if somebody pulls out in front of you in traffic, you idiot, that's on a good day. <laughs> then I went to the university and I got a doctor's degree in professional jackal. <laughs> now if you pull out in front of me in traffic, you pseudo-neurotic schizophrenic. <laughs> so I saw that the profession I had been trained in was just teaching me a more sophisticated way of criticizing and attacking others. It taught me a way of mentally diagnosing and analyzing people, which is what I thought was the problem that got them to see me to begin with. So I decided that a giraffe would be a much better process even in the counseling situation, which is one of the reasons I gave up being a professional jackal. Well, I went to a shrink in a clinic near me. He said I was a case of total pathology. I said, shrink, I knew that before I came in. I need someone to care, not just analyzing. He asked me if I had any strange habits. Oh, I said a few, but I was always willing to learn some more. So he gave me some pills, he said to take them each day. But I said pills wouldn't take my blues away. I said, shrink my blues come from people like you who know what I am, but not what I've been through. See, folks, he was one of those old-fashioned doctors. He still thought you needed a prescription to get drugs. Well, that shrink saw what he was trained to see. He just never got around to seeing me. So I left that shrink. I wasn't impressed. And now there's two who flew the cuckoo's nest. Yes? How, how do we deal with people who still talk to jackal language? How do we deal with people who still talk to jackal language? As we'll see this evening, I'm going to show you how to use one of the most marvelous technological devices that's ever been invented. And when you know how to use this technological device, you can speak giraffe no matter how the other person speaks. So tonight I'm going to show you how to use giraffe ears. <laughs> giraffe ears. For example, to show you, uh, give you a little preview about giraffe ears. I was working over in the West Bank in a refugee camp with about a, there's about this number of people in a mosque. There are probably more, but there, the women were behind the screen in the back, so I don't know how many women were there. But there was about this many men sitting up front. And uh, when it was heard that I was an American, one of the men jumps up, and he screams at me at the top of his voice, Murderer! And then uh, several other people jumped up and started calling me names. Child killer! Assassin! Boy, was I glad to have my ears with me that day, I'll tell you. <laughs> because as we'll see when you put on giraffe ears, you learn to hear the human being behind the message. You learn to turn your attention to what that person's feeling, what that person's needing. When you do this, as soon as you put these ears on, there are no jackals. When we have these ears on, 
we become conscious that jackal-speaking people are simply giraffes with a language problem. <laughs> when we put these ears on, we are very conscious that there is no such thing as criticism, judgment, attack. Because when we have these ears on, we are conscious that all criticism and judgment is simply a tragic expression of the speaker's needs. So with such ears, we just learn to hear what the person is feeling and needing. Now this gentleman that started to call me a murderer, about an hour later invited me to a Ramadan dinner at his house. You see, the power of these ears. So aren't you excited to be able to get a pair of these and be, be wearing them out in the public? <laughs> the other nice thing about it, the other nice thing about it, if you're shy, you don't even have to wear these things. <laughs> I'll teach you tonight how to put on a pair internally so that no matter what language the other person is speaking, you learn to tune in to that person's heart and hear what that person is feeling and needing. But we'll, we'll get to that. Now, I was very glad that I didn't put these ears on that, that day. <laughs> because if somebody calls me a name and I put these ears on, it's a different world. Now I have a choice which end to put in. See, if I put the ears on this way, I take the message personally. Because somebody calls me a name like a murderer, I start to feel like P P P P P T. Piss poor protoplasm, poorly put together. <laughs> I don't know how to translate that into Danish. I'm sorry. This is a horrible set of ears to have on because if you put these ears on and somebody calls you names, you really start to think there's something wrong with you. You take it personally. Then it's very scary to be out in a jackal speaking world because, as we all know, you're going to hear a lot of judgments when you're in a jackal-speaking world. And if you put the ears on this way, you're going to end up feeling like P-P-P-P-P-T a good deal of the time. You'll know that you have these ears on if you spend a good deal of every day feeling depressed, guilty, or full of shame. That tells you you've got these ears on turned this way. Well, now, of course, we could put the ears on the other way when somebody calls us a name. And now we tell them what's wrong with them for telling us what's wrong with us, you see. And you know you have the ears on going out this way when you feel angry. <coughs> Anger tells us we have jackal ears on judging other people. Depression, shame, guilt, we've got them on this way. So I'm not here to teach you how to use these tonight. My experience is in the countries in which I work, people have had ample opportunity learning how to use this technology. I'll start with the assumption tonight that you don't need to be shown how to put on jackal ears. Okay, let's learn some giraffe. I'm going to ask you to write down some things. First, let's look at this subject of education. How we educate somebody whose behavior is not enriching our life in some way. And we want to educate this person. We want this person to see that what they're now doing is not meeting our needs. And we want to communicate with this person in a way that maximizes the possibility that they will be interested in, in acting in, in harmony with our needs and that they will do this willingly, not motivated by fear, guilt, or shame. So. Obviously, this is going to happen regularly for all of us because when you get more than one human being uh, together, uh, there's going to be differences that happen where people are going to act in ways that are not necessarily enriching the lives of one another. So we need to have some language skills for educating people at these times. So I'd like you to think of somebody tonight who's behaving in a jackalish manner. And by that I mean they're saying or doing something that is not enriching your life. It's not in harmony with your needs, not in harmony with your values. 
This could be a child jackal. This could be an adult jackal. This could be somebody at work. Could be somebody at home. I've even been told husbands and wives can be jackals. So whoever you want to pick tonight to work on, I hope we get a wide variety of different situations so we can see giraffe at work in a lot of different situations. Now I'm going to have you imagine that you are going to go to this jackal and you're going to be honest with this jackal about the behavior on the jackal's part that bothers you. So what I need from you in writing is a sample of at the moment how you define honesty. And I don't want the definition, I want a, a, an example of it. So I'd like you to write down word for word what you might say to this jackal, again where your purpose is to educate the jackal, to get the person to change the behavior and to change it willingly. I'd like you to pretend that this is the person that you're speaking to and then we'll have the giraffe coach you if the giraffe has some suggestions as to how you might communicate differently in this situation. Don't be afraid of the jackal, he has no teeth. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Uh, I've chosen a person I work with. Uh, somebody at work. Yes. Uh, shall I say what, what the problem is? No, just, uh, we just need to hear the sample of what you wrote down. Just say it right to the jackal, and if we need more information, we'll ask you. Uh, do I have to be me, or do I have to be this person? No, you're going to be yourself, and you're going to be honest with this jackal. Oh, okay. Um, Uh, I do not feel too well when you approach me. Why? <laughs> I don't feel you, res you respect me. Oh! <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> almost any time you say, I feel that you, <clears throat> your likelihood of getting what you need is almost zero. And you're very likely to get a person being very defensive, because notice that you said, I don't feel that you respect me. That's an analysis of the other person. Yes. Remember what I said a few moments ago. All analysis, when we are giraffe-speaking people, we are conscious as a tragic expression of our needs. So let's help you say that in another way. When we speak giraffe, there's three pieces of information that we make clear to the other person instead of that kind of analysis. See, when we make an analysis of somebody, such as, I feel that you don't respect me, I think we're trying to say three things. But by putting it in the form of an interpretation, that sounds to somebody with these ears as though they've done something wrong. They're being criticized and analyzed and makes it very hard for them to respond with compassion to whatever it is that you need. So the first thing we want to substitute for that judgment we want to tell this person what he or she does that makes life less than wonderful for you. That's what I call here, what you're observing. So what is it that this person is doing or not doing that's behind your diagnosis of them as not respecting you? When this person talks to me, she never talks directly to me. Never? No. Never. Okay, as long as it's never. I've been working with her for three months. And now, what do you mean, doesn't talk directly to you? See, that still has a bit of an analysis in it. Mm -hmm. So we need to clear up this observation a little bit. So what is it that this person does or doesn't do that you're, re you're referring to as not talking directly to you? When she comes with her critics to me, the when she comes what? With critics. No, no. I don't criticize. No, but, but when I'm being criticized... No, I've never criticized you. No, okay. <laughs> I'm educating you. <coughs> I'm stating the facts, you see. To a jackal, they don't ever think they're criticizing. They think they're just telling the truth. <laughs> so when I come to you and tell you some things that I don't like... No, she doesn't come to me and tell me things that she don't like. So I tell other people th 
I go to other people. Yes, or in my presence, she's talking to me, but not looking at so me. So I say some things to you, but I don't look at you. Yes. Ah, or that's... say to somebody else when I'm present. So I talk to other people when you're present. Yes. And it's your belief that this re refers to you. No, I, I know it refers to me. Well, that's an analysis. Even if it's an accurate analysis. No, because she, she, she says that it's to me. Ah, so then later this person says no, that. No, 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 no. <laughs> right at that in moment. This situation, yes. So right at that moment, I, I she see. makes it clear to you yes. that this is really for you. Yes. But she doesn't say it to you. She yes. says it to somebody else. And she doesn't look at you. Yes, ah, exactly. That's what we call an observation. Now, you've just described the behavior with no analysis. You haven't said that this is not being respectful, indirect, or anything. You've just described the behavior. Yes. Now, the second thing we're going to do, we're now going to tell the jackal, how do you feel when the jackal does that? I feel very hurt. You feel very hurt. The giraffe is dancing. That means that you were expressing a feeling. Uh, third, why do you feel that way? Because I need to be approached directly. Aha. There again, perfect giraffe. You, re you expressed your feelings. You explained your feelings with reference to your need. Or another way of saying that, we just expressed how we are. See, this, is a, this question, how are you, is asked in every country in which I work. How are you? Como talez-vous? Como está usted? Every country asks how you are. Because our safety and our trust of one another is highly dependent on our getting reliable information back about how people are. Now, as we all know, in jackal cultures, the question isn't taken seriously. <laughs> so people don't develop a clear, open, honest way of revealing how they are. So when we are giraffe-speaking people, we want to do just what you did, not put judgments out to the other person, I feel that you're not respecting me, but putting it in the language that we just did. But we don't want to stop there. See, we never stop after explaining how we are in giraffe. We always want to end on an opportunity to enrich life. Or another way of saying that is we want to make a request of what we would like the person to do that would make life more wonderful for us. So let's add this at the end. So, what are you wanting from this jackal? I want her respect. Now, the problem with that is that when we answer this question, what we are requesting in giraffe, we need to use positive action language. And that means we need to state a concrete action that we want the person to take. Because if we use language like, I want you to respect me, I want you to understand me, I want you to accept me. These are very important things for each of us to receive from other people. But I find that we're not as likely to get them if we ask for them in that way. Uh, for example, I was with uh, some couples uh, recently that were asking me to show them how to speak giraffe in couples relationship. And uh, one of the women said to her husband, I want you to understand me. He says, I do understand. She says, no, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. <laughs> Fifteen years they had had <laughs> that dialogue. So I said to her husband, could I play your role for a moment? He said, please. <laughs> so I said to the wife, say it again. You never understand me. You never listen to me. And then playing the husband's role, I said, so you're really feeling very frustrated and would like more con contact when we communicate. The wife started to cry. <laughs> the wife started crying. Because I was giving her what she really needed, you see. What she was really requesting is that before her husband responds, she needed something back from him that, that told her that there was a connection. But see, she didn't ask for that. She didn't say at the end, husband, mm -hmm. I would like you when I talk and I ask for it, would you be willing to tell me back what you've heard me say before you react? See, that would be using positive action language. 
not using vague language like, I want you to understand, I want you to listen. So let's tell this jackal concretely what you want the jackal to do differently. To talk directly to me. So you want me to talk directly to you. OK, so now you vet, let's put all four of them together. Jackal, when uh, you look at other people, but talk to me at that time, and don't look at me, I feel very hurt, because I really need somebody to be direct and to talk directly with me. So would you be willing, in the future, to talk directly to me? Look at me and tell me straight to, to me what, what's going on between you and me. OK? Now, do you predict that the strength of giraffe is such that your jackal would respond this way? I'm very touched by how openly you've communicated with me. <laughs> and uh, I really admire how specific and clear you were. Of course, I would be willing to do exactly as you request. <laughs> is that how you predict your jackal would respond? No, I think it's a bit more than that. Uh, I ask you not to have skeptics here tonight, Klaus. Uh, OK, so we must prepare you then for the real world, because as I said earlier, we want to be able to speak giraffe no matter how the other person speaks. So now, what good does talking directly to you do? You never listen. Did you ever try? Pardon? Did you ever try? Ow! <laughs> now, oh, I see what the problem is. I forgot, I forgot to have you put on these ears, you see. Now, put on these ears, okay? okay? You got the ears on. Now, when you have these ears on, I don't know if you can see from back there, but with these ears on, this is all you hear. Are you feeling, and you tune in to what the person is feeling, and then you try to hear what needs are behind the feeling. So let's try that out. What good does talking to you do? You never listen. I'm, I'm not thinking. What is this person feeling when the person says that? You see, if you have these ears on, oh, yes. all you hear is the feelings. You hear no criticism, no judgment, no attack. You simply hear what the person is feeling and needing. So what do you sense? We don't have to be right as a giraffe. No. We just have to be looking at what's going on in this person. So what might she or he be feeling if they made that statement? What good does talking to you do? You never listen. Somebody want to help her out? What do you think this jackal might be feeling? Yes? Nobody ever listens to me. That's what the jackal would be thinking. But let me offer you a suggestion. Never hear what a jackal thinks. It's ugly up there. <laughs> no, no. I think you will like people so much better if we tune into their heart, not to their head, especially if they're a jackal-speaking person. All you'll see coming out of there is a bunch of judgment. No, no. With these ears, we tune into the heart. What, is it, what might this person be feeling who says, what good does talking do? You never listen. Maybe frustration. Maybe frustration. We can't be, we don't know for sure. We have to check it out. Yeah. It feels neglected. Pardon? It feels ne neglected. Now we have to watch out for words like neglected because that's more what the jackal thinks. They think they're being neglected. When we are giraffe speaking people, we only use words for feeling words that clearly capture our emotion and that aren't really words for describing what others are doing to us. Let me give you several of those words so you can start to develop giraffe ears for feeling words. Jackal, I feel used. See how that describes what somebody's doing to you. It doesn't say how the jackal feels. I feel misunderstood. I feel cheated. I feel rejected. Neglected. I feel ignored. Aren't there times when you think somebody's ignoring you? Don't you feel relieved? <laughs> At other times when you think somebody's ignoring you, don't you feel hurt? So 
So you see how words like that really don't capture what's going on inside. So if we speak a word like, I feel neglected, somebody with these ears is going to hear that much more likely as an attack, a criticism of what they're doing. So frustration, yes, but not neglected. How else? Any other guesses as to what this jackal might be feeling? Yeah? Feel sad. Might be sad. That's a feeling. So any guess of a feeling is giraffe. Again, to repeat, we don't have to be right because we can always check it out with the person. We can always say, jackal, are you feeling sad? And then they can say, no, I'm hurt or I'm mad. The idea of putting on the giraffe ears is to tune into the other person's feeling. In fact, it isn't even necessary always to say it out loud. The miracle occurs at the moment we put on the giraffe ears, even if we don't say a word. Because when we direct our attention here to what's going on inside the other person, we take all power away from other people to deplete our morale, to make us feel bad about ourselves. And what's nice about this is that it's as good for the other person as it is for us. Because when we do tune in to what's going on inside of them, we are much more likely to respond with compassion to them. So everybody benefits at the moment we put on the giraffe ears, even if we don't say a word. Okay, so let's go with that first guess for the moment. Let's guess that this person might be frustrated. Now, the second thing that we do is to guess what the person is needing behind frustration. In English, this can be done in several ways. We can say, are you feeling frustrated because you would have liked? Or we can say, are you frustrated because you're needing or because you're wanting? The language doesn't make so much importance here as that we look for what is the need that isn't being fulfilled when this person says, what good does talking to you do? You never listen. So that shouldn't be too hard to guess. What do you think that person is needing? So somebody, some list, somebody to listen. So let's check it out. Let's see how the giraffe then would put these two things together. What good does talking to you do? You never listen. So Jackal, are you feeling frustrated because you would like uh, me to listen differently and better when you do talk? Oh, you couldn't even if you tried. You're so narcissistically involved in yourself, you think only you know anything that's <laughs> worth knowing. And I'm not the only one that thinks that. <laughs> Now aren't you glad you have giraffe ears? You see? Because without giraffe ears, you could take that personally. Or you could start to think there's something wrong with this jackal for thinking that way. And at the moment that you would think in either of those ways, the chance that both you and the other person are going to get your needs met is not very good in my experience. But with giraffe ears, we hear no criticism in what the jackal just said. We know that that's the more something sounds like an attack, the more pain the other person is in. And that's just an unmet need. It's a gift. It's a give us an opportunity to enrich this person's life. An opportunity because we hear it as a, a request. We don't hear it as a demand. Because as giraffes, we can hear other people's needs, but we don't lose our own boundaries. We don't necessarily give up our needs to fulfill the other person's needs. As a giraffe, we are conscious that what people need most of all is contact. They need to feel that their needs matter. And that doesn't mean we have to do what they're asking, but that we accurately receive what they are needing. So how could the giraffe respond to that complicated message? You couldn't listen even if you tried. You think only you have anything worth saying. Well, there's other people with some intelligence around here beside you. So, Jacko, it sounds like you're really annoyed and you'd like me to acknowledge that, that uh, other people have something of worth to offer. 
Oh, but you couldn't, because you're really a very sick person, you know that? So you're feeling kind of hopeless about whether this could happen, and, and you'd like me to change, but you're not sure that I can. Notice this poor jackal is kind of dazzled. Don't pull any of that psychology crap on me. <laughs> well, why wouldn't a jackal think that? Because, you know, with this kind of ears, you feel somebody really trying to understand you, and this isn't the way most people in your life have responded to you when you're judging them like that. Of course a jackal start, might start to feel some suspicion wonder whether this is a new way of exploiting and manipulating people. <laughs> what amazes me is how rarely this response comes back. And that's because even if the jackal is a little suspicious, it feels so good to be heard, to have somebody genuinely interested in hearing what your feelings and needs are behind your statement. <coughs> but even if that message does come out, don't use any of that psychology crap on me. No problem if we have giraffe ears. We hear the feelings and needs behind that sentence. We may do it silently, because we know if we say it outside, out loud, the person may misinterpret us. But there, what do we hear? We hear the person might be feeling suspicious. And what is the need? He wants to avoid being exploited in some way that he's not familiar with. So we just hear the human being behind that message as behind every message. So, any other questions you have about how we would speak giraffe with your jack? No, it's fine. <laughs> I'm glad you offered that. That's a good learning situation for us. Any questions or comments about that situation before we turn to another one? Yes, sir? Is it your experience that Jackal-speaking people change or learn when you speak giraffe to them? Is it my experience that they change when I speak giraffe? At the moment that I put on these ears, they're already changed. Because as I say, when I have these ears on, the other person is automatically a giraffe-speaking person. Because all I hear coming from them is feelings and needs. But I think I know that you, what you're getting at, and the answer would be yes to that. It amazes me how, when we keep speaking giraffe ourselves, the other person joins us, unless they hear a demand. We're going to be talking about demands in a few moments. See, in giraffe, we always end on a very clear <coughs> statement of what we want. But now, a giraffe is very clear about the difference between a request and a demand. But jackals get these all mixed up. So, I was in Zurich, uh, Switzerland uh, about six months ago and doing a weekend workshop. And on uh, Sunday, the woman at whose house I was staying had a van and so we were going to pick up three other women en route to the workshop. And it was amazing what a similar experience all three had had. They had gone home full of excitement after the first evening and they had said to their husband, oh, I've been exposed to this wonderful process and I would really like you to join me in it. <laughs> and it was amazing how each of the husbands responded in the same way, you know. I don't have any problems communicating. You're the one that needs that, not me. <laughs> Something like that. Well, you see, the problem was these jackal husbands, instead of hearing the excitement and to hear their wives requesting that they join them in this new thing, they heard a demand. And when jackals or anybody hear a demand, they see their choices as submission or rebellion. So that day in the workshop, we had to learn how to help their jackals hear this as a request so that then they could make a choice about whether they wanted to, to engage in this kind of learning and not that they feel they had to. So while we're on that topic, let me make clear for you all the difference between a giraffe request and a jackal demand. You and I are very close, and I say to you one evening, I'm so lonely this evening, I would really like you to spend the evening with me. 
Now, is that a giraffe request or a jackal demand? Yes. That's a, a giraffe request. A giraffe request. Boy, are you trusting. <laughs> we don't know yet. You can't tell whether it is a request or a demand from how nicely it is asked. How do you find out? We will find out very quickly when you say back to me, Marshall, I'd really like to spend this evening by myself. I have some reading and other things that I would like to do. Now, I respond this way. <laughs> Two days later. <laughs> Giraffe, what's the matter? Nothing. <laughs> Come on, what's the matter? You knew how lonely I was that night. You knew how sad I was that night. If you loved me, you would have been with me. <laughs> now we know it was a demand, you see. Because it's a demand when if the other person's needs are not the same as yours, you take it as a rejection. You define love as love is you deny your own needs and take care of the other person. That's how a jackal defines love. Love is self-sacrifice, self-denial. You deny yourself and take care of the other person. Of course, you always give them a bill for it later. <laughs> so that's why, you see, uh, some people, if they hear this as a real pressure to do this, they might resist it. But I have been amazed over the years how quickly people tell me their relatives change, their, their people that they work change, even though they had no hope ahead of time that it would ever happen. Because I think the reason for that is, I think giraffe is a natural way for human beings to communicate. Now, when I was learning giraffe, it, I kept saying to myself, this isn't a natural way for people to talk. And just at the right moment, I read something that Gandhi said. Gandhi said, don't mix up that which is habitual with that which is natural. So yeah, that made sense to me. Certainly, it wasn't habitual for me to speak giraffe. But Gandhi says, that which is natural is that which you gravitate to spiritually. It feels right to you, and you're willing to do a lot of practice, a lot of work, because you see the work is in the harmony of your own values. So I really do believe that giraffe is much closer to, to the, the spiritual basis of people. And they feel that talking in this way makes more sense intuitively to talk just about what they feel and what they need, in spite of the fact that they, haven't, they may have to do a lot of practice, in spite of the fact that for a while, until we learn how to use these ears, it can be kind of scary because it requires being open and honest in a pretty vulnerable way. And we know that until the other people do join us, we're likely to hear a lot of things coming back that we're going to need these ears on. A woman in uh, Stockholm, she was in a three-day training with me, and at the end of the three days, she said, you know, Marshall, I can see this working in my business, but I can't imagine doing it with my father. He is a jackal's jackal. No, he's never had anybody, he's never had a friend in his life for more than a month or two. He has five children, none of us can talk to him. He's had two wives, neither of whom could talk to him. I could never imagine uh, talking to him this way. Uh, <clears throat> About six months later, I returned to Stockholm, and this woman greeted me at another workshop. And she said, Marshall, do you remember at the end of the previous workshop, I told you how I could never do this with my father? I said, no, I don't. I hear that from a lot of people. So, uh, I can't remember. She says, anyway, I don't know what possessed me, but I went home, and he greeted me at the door and said, another workshop, wasting your money on another one of those things? And she said, Marshall, before the workshop, I would have said, 
but Father, I'm 50 years old, I can spend my money as I want to. <laughs> and then we would have an argument for sure. And this time I stopped and I put on my ears and I said, Dad, are you worried because you want to be sure that I'm saving enough money to protect myself? And she said, Marshall, within a few moments, he was opening up and letting me see a soft side of himself that I never thought I was going to see in this lifetime. And since then, my brothers and sisters have been saying to me, what are you doing with him? We've never <laughs> seen him respond this way. The magic of giraffe ears. The other person will join me. Maybe not that rapidly all the time. <laughs> Let's have another situation. Who's got another jackal for us to tame? I hope somebody does. It's embarrassing sitting up here playing with these puppets all by myself. <laughs> Thank you, yes. I would very much like to hear something about a child uh, being like him and the mother being just as well <laughs> as bad as him. Oh, a, a parent-child situation. Who is the child? Who is the giraffe? Not yet. <laughs> no, nobody yet. Well, let's, let's start off, Mom. How old am I, Mom? Nine years. I'm, pardon? Nine years. Nine years old. Yeah. Okay, Mom. What am I, tell me, what is it that I'm doing that you don't like? Very demanding. Oh! <laughs> the child asked you for an observation, and you gave him a diagnosis. So observation, Mom, no diagnosis. Very demanding is two diagnoses. Demanding is a diagnosis, and very is a double diagnosis. Tell him the answer to the question. What is he doing? It is very difficult to, to find a word. It is very difficult. In fact, Mom, the uh, philosopher Jadu Krishnamurti says that in his estimation, the highest form of human intelligence is the ability to observe without evaluating. So yes, it's very difficult to answer this question of, Mom, what am I doing? And to answer that without making any criticism, diagnosis, analysis, the highest form of human intelligence, according to this philosophy. Well, I, I'm observing um, very uh, Excited? Uh, no, uh, any feeling, Mom, is a diagnosis. <laughs> I just can't describe it. Well, when's the last time? Think of a concrete situation, Mom. And what was I doing at that time? You said very demanding. Is it something that he asked you, he asked you three or four times for something, even when you have told him the reasons he why? Won't, he, won't, uh, he won't be able to have it. He, he, he just wants to have things which I, I know that I can't give him. Hold it, Mom. You said can't. Can't is pure jackal. He knows you could if you wanted to. <laughs> so why would you lie to him? <laughs> See, there's no word for can't in giraffe. We are, if we're an honest gi giraffe, we don't say can't. We say, I don't know how to, and I want to be shown how to, or I don't I, want to. If I say I, I can't, then I, I mean that I um, don't want him to have these things because I think it's not good for him. OK, now we're coming closer. So now, I want, I want this candy. I want this candy. I want this candy. <laughs> Should I answer to that? Yes, answer, Mom. I believe we should not have it. Oh! <laughs> Mom, may I suggest something to you? If you want to make life easier for you and your child, find another word beside the one you just used, because whenever you use that word, you're likely to escalate so nobody gets their needs met. And it's a word that I can't say because it's blasphemous for a giraffe to say it. So I'll let the jackal say it. 
should <laughs> I believe you should see that's how a jackal speaks their values I believe I think and then they use language like should ought must can't I was working with some parents in one community and when I told the parents about how dangerous I felt this language was that denies choice like can't should, ought, must. This one mother got very upset with me and she says, well, but there are some things you have to do whether you like to do it or not. I see nothing wrong with telling my children that there's things that they have to do. I had just finished saying that I thought have to guarantees you won't get what you want when you use that language. So I said, could you give me an example, mother, about what one of these things are that you have to do whether you like to do it or not? She said, that's easy. When I leave this workshop this evening, I have to go home and cook. <laughs> I hate to cook. I hate it with a passion, but I have done it every day for 20 years, even when I have been sick as a dog. So I told her that I was hoping I could uh, teach her some giraffe, because I believe that it might open up some happier possibilities for her. I'm pleased to announce that she was a very rapid giraffe student. She went home that very evening and announced to her family that she no longer wanted to cook. <laughs> I got some feedback from her family. <laughs> Three weeks later, who shows up but her older two sons? And they got there a little early, so I was very curious. Uh, and I, because she had been calling me, it seemed like every other day, telling me about major changes in her life when she got rid of all of this have to, should, ought thinking. So I said to the oldest son, what was that like when your mother came home that first night and announced that she no longer wanted to cook? He said, Marshall, I just said to myself, thank God. <laughs> well, I said, John, how did you come to that? He said, I said to myself, now maybe she won't complain at every meal. You see, when we trick ourselves into thinking we should, ought, must, have to, we lose connection with the real purpose, with how it serves life. So a giraffe, these, for those things which are very important, doesn't say, I have to or you have to. says, I would like to. I would like you to. Because. And then we want people to see clearly how it serves life. But we know that if you use language that denies choice, have to, should, ought, must, can't, that makes it hard for people to stay conscious of the purpose by which they're doing things. So none of that language, Mom. Just use the language of your needs, your feelings, but not a language of shoulds, oughts, musts, have tos, and can'ts. Conversation is escalating. Uh, you, you mentioned that before. That uh, if um, if you can't um, respond in a giraffe way, then um, you are likely to escalate uh, each one. Uh, I predict that unless you're a real mean jackal, <laughs> and then you say, "Look, I told you so," and you either do it my way or I'll make you wish you had. <laughs> And if the person knows that you are a real deranged jackal, they'll probably be very nice and obedient. I'm not recommending that. Because giraffes make a big difference between personal responsibility and obedience. The jackals get those mixed up. They'll say, my child is very responsible. He does everything that I say. Uh, excuse me, but are you mixing up responsibility, personal responsibility, with obedience? What's the difference? You can send a dog to obedience school. Not hard to teach people obedience, but personal sense of responsibility requires choice, and a choice based on one's own values, not on a fear of punishment. So back to this situation. I want some candy now. I'm hungry. I want some candy now. 
Too easy. <laughs> what's, what's harder, Mom? Because then I can uh, come with some arguments and say something about uh, the teeth and the, the evening meal or whatever. Which Mom, let me suggest that the most powerful way you can respond is not with an argument, but with empathy. The way a giraffe says no begins with empathy. When you show empathy for the other person's needs, it becomes easier for them to hear what needs of yours might keep you from saying yes. But if the first thing they hear back from you is reasons for why they can't, they feel alone <coughs> in their need. They don't feel that their need matters. It's through empathy that we give people the awareness that their needs matter. And empathy, as I said earlier, doesn't mean then that we must now deny our needs and do what the other person wants. So let's start, Mom, by just showing empathy for the person's needs. Just reflect back so you're really feeling it and show that you understand the need in a respectful way. I don't want to go to school today. I hate that school. It's a stupid school. Well, then I uh, very often respond with a question. What kind of question? Uh, is there anything wrong with you? Do you oh! <laughs> That's a jackal question. Ask this kind of question, Mark. Try to show what he's feeling and, and needing right at this moment. Yes, I say, for example, are, are you feeling ill or are you feeling... Uh, no, I'm child? not ill. I just hate the teacher and I hate the school. The kids all tease me and the teacher's mean. We first want to be sure that we're really hearing this person's feeling. So watch the giraffe, and then I'll have you do it after the giraffe does. I hate school. The teacher's really mean, and the kids all tease me. Yeah, so you really hate going in there today, and you really don't like the way that the teacher responds to you or the children. Yeah, they make fun of me, and they call me names. Yeah, so you feel very hurt, and you'd really like them to treat you with more respect. Yeah. <laughs> Now the child feels he, he or she's not alone. There's somebody with them right now. Now notice we're putting off what we're going to do about this yet. Because the giraffe parent knows that until we've really connected at the feeling and the need level, it's too early to start solving the problem. Jackals immediately try to fix the problem. You see. They immediately try to find a resolution. <coughs> Giraffes know that even if you come upon a quick resolution, when there hasn't been empathy, it won't stick. So the first thing we need is to be able to connect with the person's feeling. I don't want to go to school today. The teacher's mean and the kids tease me. So your feeling, connect with the person's feeling. Are you feeling? That's what you say first. Are you feeling? Are you feeling hurt? Because? It's because there was a, a calling your name. So now, <laughs> notice that we say in giraffe, are you feeling hurt because you? Now, let me show you the importance of that. You see, let me re d digress for just a moment. Let me show you how a jackal parent trains a child to be a jackal child. Notice how the jackal parent expresses feeling. It really hurts me when you don't clean up your room. <laughs> you see, this is because jackals use guilt as a primary <coughs> tactic for imposing their will on other people. And guilt, in this case, requires the other person to believe that he or she can cause this person's feeling. So when a giraffe jackal, excuse me, when the jackal expresses their feelings, they don't do it this way. They don't say, I feel hurt because I. They imply always that it's the other person that hurts them. I feel hurt because you didn't pick up your room. So we don't want to reinforce that kind of thinking that implies that our feelings are caused by forces outside of ourselves. So now, when we're trying to understand the other person's feelings, 
We don't say, are you feeling hurt because the children are teasing you? Because eventually we want to teach this child to put on giraffe ears and to see that it's never what the other people do that causes your feelings. It's what ears you put on. So we would say, are you feeling hurt because you would like the children to treat you differently? See, we want the person to connect their feelings with their needs, not to connect their feelings with what other people do. Because the more we connect their feelings with what other people do, the more they become dependent on other people's behavior for their own internal well-being. We want to teach the child to be a giraffe child, which requires that we be conscious that our internal life is only controlled by us, not other people. So try it again, Mom. And the, the, the teacher's mean, and the children tease me. Are you feeling? Uh, are you feeling hurt uh, because you want to be with the others, or you? I want them to. I want them to, you know, to talk nice to me and not to tease me. Hi, yeah. So do I have to go to school today? <laughs> Let me warn you, this is a loaded question. <laughs> Let's hear how the giraffe parent handles that. Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking me when you say, do you have to? Oh, uh, well. <laughs> uh, do I have to? I'd be glad to tell you what I would like you to do but only if I'm sure you don't hear it as what you should do or what you have to do. Because I'd really see the parent wants to have his or her authority respected. That means that we certainly want to let the child benefit by our experience, by our values. But we want the child not to think that because we have certain values, they have to do what we want. So if you'd want me to tell you what I'd like, I'd be glad to. Yeah, I'd like that. I would like you to go to school and wear giraffe ears. Huh? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, it would be my hope that you could learn how to respond differently when people call you names. How? I'd like you to learn to put on giraffe ears. What's that? I'd be glad to show you. So that would be what I would want as a parent. I'd want to show him how to not give the teacher the power to make him feel bad. Not to give other people, the children, the power to make him feel bad. Uh, when my oldest son uh, went to a jackal school for the first time, he had gone for about the first uh, six grades to a giraffe school that I had helped create. But then he went to the next year to a jackal school for the first time. So when he came home from school the first day, I said, uh, how was that new school, Rick? He said, OK, Dad, but just some of those teachers. I said, what happened? He said, I wasn't in the door more than one, one minute. I just walked in the front door, and some man teacher comes running over to me and says, my, my, look at the little girl. Can any of you guess what the teacher was reacting to? Yeah, my son had long hair at the time, before you saw many men wearing long hair. So I was thinking some rather jackalish thoughts to myself at that moment about a teacher <laughs> who would greet a child, you know, a brand new child in a school that way, and then use the word girl as though it's an insult. So I was kind of boiling on the inside, and I said, how did you handle it? He said, I did your thing, Dad. I just hurt him with giraffe ears. <laughs> I said, you remembered to do it under those conditions. I feel wonderful about that. What did you hear? Well, it wasn't hard. I just heard that he was feeling irritated and wanted me to get a shorter haircut. <laughs> I said, how did that leave you feeling? He said, Dad, I felt sad for the man. He was bald and se seemed to have a thing about hair. <laughs> <laughs> so am I saying anything that's helping you with this nine-year-old? Is there anything more I could uh, clarify about giraffe as parenting? 
a very good start uh, to uh, to have this picture. And uh, a few days before I came here, I heard about uh, what you were talking about, and I tried it immediately with my son. And um, he was very fascinated. And sometimes I just say, now look at me, look deep in my eyes, and imagine you are a giraffe and I am. And then he's really smelting. I've tried this uh, just one week ago. Now you've just made my day. <laughs> I like very much that people hear about it from somebody else and then they go and try it, and uh, I really do like to hear how giraffe gets around. So I'm very pleased that you have friends that are giraffe, because for me, the hardest application of giraffe for me is in my role as a parent. See, I notice I started off the night telling you this story where I was able to put on giraffe years, where I was in, you know, with 170 people near screaming murderer. For me, that's an easy situation, much easier than when I'm talking to my children. Why? Because I have all kinds of jackal training as relates to my role as the parent. Like, I'm the parent. I know what's best. One time I even said to my oldest son, I think I know better than you do. I have a PhD. <laughs> he said, what does that stand for? FUD? So uh, it's very hard for me to do this as a parent. Now, I'd like to, therefore, to suggest to you that the number one thing that I recommend to parents who really want to live this way with their children, be sure that you are getting a lot of empathy yourself. Because unless I have somebody that I can turn to, a giraffe, daily and say, I get so frustrated when right in the middle of, I'm in the store and he keeps saying he has to have this. And, I didn't want to take the time to sit down and have this discussion with him. And then he's kept getting more and more jackal-like. And then, and then I come home and I told my husband how frustrated I was. And then he said, you shouldn't let it bother you. And then I wanted to kill him. And then <laughs> it's so hard for me to get everybody in the family to talk this way and to listen this way. So now I have a giraffe teammate, close giraffe, to give me the giraffe listening that I need. The more I have that quality of listening, then the more I can apply this with my family. Any comments or questions more about giraffe parenting? You know, we had a uh, session in, uh, where was that? San Diego, California, about three years ago, uh, where we have children and coming with uh, their parents to an evening workshop like this. And a young man came up to me after the uh, workshop, and he said, this is wonderful. You ought to get this to all the teachers in the world. Uh, so I thanked this nine-year-old gentleman for his vote of confidence. And I said, but that's a lot of work for me to do all by myself. I'll need your help. He says, what can I do? I'm just a kid. And then I suggested some things he could do. Well, the next night we had a session open to the public like this one tonight. And who comes but his teacher and the headmistress at his school. <laughs> because one of the things we said that he could do is go and tell them that he got a lot out of it and he would really like them to do. Now, I'm very pleased to announce that if you go to that school now, the master's school in uh, San Diego, you will see it de has declared itself a giraffe school. <laughs> all of the parents, all of the teachers, all of the students have studied giraffe together. Uh, and there are several other schools like that in uh, the United States and now some other countries uh, where we show the schools how to set up the school on a giraffe basis so that the giraffe, the school functions in harmony uh, with this. I've written a book about that called uh, Mutual Education, and uh, it's published only in Swedish, so some of you can probably handle that. So if any of you are interested afterwards, I'll give you the title in uh, Swedish. Yes? I'm a teacher, and I think it's so <laughs> difficult in class situations, in situations 
when a lot of children are, <coughs> for example, going around and some are beating each other, how to be angry, endure it. Yes, well, let me reassure you, teacher, that, that to be giraffe does not mean you must mm. be calm and patient mm. and that you can't be angry. You need to know how to scream in giraffe. Uh, I was asked to come into a teacher's classroom in Buellton, California. I had been there six months before working with the teachers. And the teacher, who really was the best giraffe teacher we had, for a reward they kept sending all of the difficult children to communicate with into her classroom. So she requested when I came back to do a follow-up with the staff that I spend half a day in her classroom. And she asked me if I would conduct the classroom and she wanted to see what she was doing wrong. Well, I aged 40 years in that one, uh, that one half of a day. It was really rough work. So at the noontime, we were eating, and she said, Marshall, I really want to thank you for coming into that class today. I can't tell you what a valuable learning experience that was for me. I said, what was valuable about it? She said, you don't know how good it was watching you suffer. <laughs> You see, the transition from a jackal system to a giraffe system, that transition is a very difficult one because in a jackal system, they control people through punishment and reward. Now, when people have had that kind of control by the adults, they don't know internal control. So it, this transition period, it can really age the giraffe parent or the giraffe teacher. So it is one that, especially where the person needs a lot of emotional support from other people. And very often, unfortunately, the teachers tell me instead of getting that support, they get jackaled by the administration, you see, who come in and the class isn't in order in the way they have defined it. So uh, in a uh, pick a situation, and I'll see if I can show you more concretely how this can be applied. So two children are fighting. Okay, now, uh, in one school, they wanted me to, the school that had the most fighting in this uh, school district, they wanted me to demonstrate how to deal with children who were fighting in a giraffe way. And they had the educational television people come to the school that day with their cameras, and the teachers were notified that if there was a fight that day, they were to bring the two fighters down to me in the courtyard and then we would make a videotape of me solving it. And that morning, I remember that the, the, edu the school administrators worrying about all the trouble they had gone to to get the television people there. They said, what if there isn't a fight today? Well, no problem. About one time I looked up, they were lined up about eight deep waiting for me to do it. So now how do we deal with this? So here's two people fighting. Pretend like this is a jackal. He start, you know, give me that ball. No, you hitting each other. Now, of course, you got to first of all stop it using whatever force is at your disposal. So maybe I have to hold them by their ears. Now, what do I do? I put on my giraffe ears, and even if they're speaking jackal, I translate it into giraffe. He's always butting into everybody's game and thinks he's better than everybody else. That's a lie. I do not. Excuse me, jackal too. Excuse me. So you feel very frustrated when he comes and grabs the ball without asking, and you would like him to ask first. Yeah. See what I did? I just put giraffe ears on, translated the jackal language into what his feelings and needs were. Now, jackal two, could you tell me what you heard him say? He's lying. You see, I, I excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Could you tell me what he said? He's always making up stories. But could you just tell me what he said? Say it again. I heard him say that he gets frustrated when you grab the ball without asking because he would really like you to ask before you grab it. Yes, but he never gives it. Excuse me, excuse me. Can you tell me back what you heard him say? Uh, incidentally, this same process that I'm demonstrating, I use it each year in my work. Sometimes these are two groups that I'm dealing with, not two individuals. Recently, I was with a group of immigrants on one side and a group of landowners on another that had had progressive acts of violence between the two groups in their community. About a month after that, I was with a police department 
and some citizens who were accusing the police department of racist characteristics. I'm also doing some work between Palestinians and Israelis, between some Croatians. Marshal, please, will you talk a bit slowly? Thank you. Between some Croatians and some Serbians. The process is exactly the same that you're seeing me demonstrate between the two children. People often do not have a language that helps the other person to see what's going on in their heart. So you loan it to them as the mediator in this case. You hear the feelings and needs, and then you get the other side to say it back. It's not going to be easy, because very few people are trained to listen. This is a world where everybody wants to talk and nobody wants to listen. But we're now also teaching the children, you see, another way of resolving differences. Now, the big problem, of course, is that what is the rest of the class doing while I'm taking the time to help these people communicate in this way? Well, one thing that they're doing, they're learning a new way of resolving conflict. And this will probably take less time because once the, we have these two people really hearing each other and resolving it, <coughs> understanding each other's feelings and needs, they're not as likely to have repeated conflicts in the future. Now, of course, as the teacher, this does take a lot of my time. Wouldn't it be great if they didn't need me in this role? So that's why I want to spend time with these students every day learning how they can use giraffe to resolve their own conflicts without my having to be involved. A teacher that I worked with has written a book called The Giraffe Classroom that has a lot of activities for teaching students in the elementary schools how to re use giraffe themselves. And this can be woven in to part of the, the school program. This song came out of uh, some work I was doing in public schools teaching giraffe to children. I would work with them during the day. And then after school, I would work with the teachers, teaching them giraffe. Uh, can you guess who learned it easier? As with most languages, I guess. And I would usually start the day by asking the children, what do you wonder about? I ask that because in jackal schools, they usually start with the assumption that the people who are the teachers know what is to be learned. And they don't allow much for wonder and active participation on the part of the students. So I like to start learning with wonder. I wonder what's worth learning. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. So when I ask children this question, what do you wonder about, I would usually get wild and wonderful answers. So Ruth Bebermeyer, who was working with me at the time, she would write down these answers that the children gave to this little game. And she told her sister about it, and the sister taught first graders, and she went and tried it with her classroom. What do you wonder about? And she came back to supper that night very excited about how the children responded. And she said, I particularly liked what this one boy said. He said, I wonder why my puppy won't eat green jello with grapefruit in it. <laughs> So Ruth uh, remembered these that she had been writing down, and so she wrote this song that night. Most of these came, these answers came directly from the children. And of course, this song is called I Wonder. I wonder why my dog won't eat green jello. I like the wiggly way it melts inside. I wonder when a turtle pulls its head in. Is it so dark it's scared to be inside? I wonder if a rock likes being hard. I wonder if the sky likes being blue. I wonder if butterflies like butter. I wonder if you like being you. I wonder why I don't feel myself stretching when people say I'm growing every day. I wonder why I always have to listen to more words than I ever get to say. I wonder if the grass cries when it's cut. I wonder if the rain hurts when it falls. I wonder if the earth gets dizzy turning. I wonder if 
little worms feel small. <laughs> I wonder why I see so many people do things they don't really want to do. I wonder if the music goes away somewhere after I sing my song to you. I wonder if it feels sad to be old. I wonder if the moon likes company. I wonder why it's fun to feel a little scared. I wonder if you wonder like me. Thank you. Where have you been tonight, honey? Now, are you a jackal or a giraffe? <laughs> Doesn't know yet. Because asking a question like that at the beginning of a communication is a good way to look like a jackal to the other person. If you really wanted to look even more jackless, you would have asked a why question. Questions usually have a very intimidating effect on other people. Why? Because behind a relatively simple question like you just asked, there's often a lot of feeling. And unexpressed feelings, like hurt, or sadness, or frustration, almost always get heard by another person as aggression, even when they're asking a very nice tone of voice. So were there feelings behind that question, Giraffe? Fear. Fear. Ah, that's the kind of thing that if we have fear, then we really need to bring it out on the table, because <coughs> it'll be less likely to be heard as aggress aggressive. So you're feeling frightened because of why? What need of yours is behind the fear? What is happening here? So you're, is that your answer? You're the giraffe, right? And you're feeling frightened. has had a nice evening and uh, is open and uh, wants to tell about tonight. Aha, uh -huh. so the giraffe just wants some connection with the other person. <coughs> so let's see how it might sound. So I'm uh, very eager for us to have some sharing this evening and I, I'd really like to know uh, how your evening went. All right. <laughs> How's that? How do you like that response from the jackal? Could you tell me more? Well, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> what have you been doing? Oh, just usual stuff. Let's get the giraffe in here to help you out a bit. Jackal, uh, I'm somewhat disappointed about the kind of discussions that we have. I, I, I just would like to know more what goes on inside of you at times. and I, I don't know how to get it from you in a way that feels safe and comfortable for you. So like right now, I, I opened up a lot to tell you what I just did. And, I'd like to know how do you feel when I say this? <laughs> oh, uh, I feel that now we already know it's not going to be a feeling. So as soon as the jackal puts the word that after the word feel, we know the jackal is up in his head. Oh, I feel that uh, you got a right to ask. <laughs> Yeah, and see, Jackal, like right now is, what, is what's happening, is what happens to me periodically in our, in our relationship. Uh, I ask for a feeling, and, and I don't know how you feel. I told you, I feel you have a right to ask for whatever you want. But from that, I, I hear that you, what you think, that you think it's OK that I ask. But I, I don't know how you feel, Jackal. Like, how do you feel when I tell you that I, I would like there to be a different level of intimacy when we communicate. How do you feel when I say that? <clears throat> I don't have any feelings about it. Like, I sensed just there from the tone of your voice that you were angry. And 
I'd like to know if that's so. No, I wouldn't say I was angry. <laughs> well, at least I know what you're not feeling. <laughs> but what are you feeling now? I feel that you're pressuring me. Then you're feeling irritated? Well, that's what I said, isn't it? Well, I'd like to point out that you, you gave me a diagnosis of me. You said that you thought I was pressuring you. And I wasn't getting from you what I was really hoping to get from you. How are you feeling, Jack? Why is it so important to talk about feelings all the time? <laughs> well, like right now, I can show you. Like when you just asked that question. I don't know whether you're hurt, scared, angry, confused behind that question. You seem to have a lot of feelings. But when I sense that you have the feelings and you don't say them, then I feel very tense because I, I really don't know what's going on. So how do you feel right now when I tell you this? Well, it's not how my family communicates. You're annoyed with me for asking? No, but Rome wasn't built in a day. <coughs> so you're feeling worried that you may not be able to do this as rapidly as I would like? Yeah, you could say that. I'm worried. Well, see, Jackal, just hearing this, just this much connection with you is what I've been longing for, that we be able to connect with each other's feelings. I can be quite patient if, if I knew that you really wanted to work at it. I still don't know how you feel about this idea of bringing feelings into our conversation more. I think it's a good idea. You're, you're glad that I brought this up? Well, that's what I said, isn't it? <laughs> if, if you followed me around in my work, no matter which country it is, you'd see that I have the following conversation sooner or later. It's usually a woman comes up to me at the end of a workshop, and she'll start something like this. Marshall, I wouldn't want you to get the wrong idea. I have a very wonderful husband. What's the next word? <laughs> but I never know what he's feeling. I never know what he's feeling. And this presents a real limitation to the quality of interaction, the quality of intimacy that people can experience when they don't have access to feeling. But coming out of the cultural background that I did, it's very easy for me to understand how men don't get much opportunity to express their feelings. In the culture I grew up in, uh, our cultural heroes were not good giraffe speakers. I don't know about your cultural heroes, but did John Wayne ever get around to these parts? You know, you know what I'm talking about, John Wayne? Well, John did not have a good feeling vocabulary. Uh, he, he had a very good diagnostic system, very simple and easy to use. He'd swing open the tavern doors, and there could be six pistols trained on him. I never recall him saying he was scared. Now, how did John communicate? He'd label people. He had a, two labels. They were either good guys, in which case you buy them a drink, or bad guys, you kill them. <laughs> you see, with that way of thinking, you don't have to worry about nuances like how to express emotions. You see. Good guys, buy them a drink. Bad guys, kill them. I grew up believing what was expected of me was to prove how strong and violent I could be. But now John Wayne is no longer my hero and I'm going to allow gentleness to show I've been afraid to admit it when I've been lonely or sad I thought feelings were weakness 
And I thought weakness was bad But now John Wayne is no longer my hero And I'm going to allow gentleness to show So I don't know, is this the kind of situation that you had in mind, or have I got, that is close to it. That's what I was afraid of. Yes, <laughs> yes such uh, jackals are wide breeding jackals. You know, uh, one of our best <clears throat> uh, selling songs in the United States in the country and western field is by Reba McIntyre. It's called uh, The Greatest Man I Never Knew. <laughs> and it's about her father. And in my work, if you'd see how many people have had fathers that they wanted the closer connection with. But I've also worked with the fathers, and I know what hell it is to be locked into that form of communication. Because they have the feeling, but they haven't had the cultural experience or training to get in touch with them. And that's a very lonely experience to be inside there and not to have access to be able to do that. So that's why we need a courageous giraffe to be able to make the request to begin with in a giraffe way, and then not to hear attacks when the person says, quit badgering me, and this is not how real people communicate. And now we just hear the feelings in that, because we know that this person will probably want it when they understand what it's all about. A man who showed a lot of courage invited his father to a three-day business workshop that I did in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, at the third day, this son uh, said, Marshall, would you mind if I did some work with my father in front of the group? Well, I'd had lunch one day with his father, and I didn't think his father would be too comfortable with that. So I said, well, let me talk to him about it. So I said to the father, your son has said he'd like to do some communication in giraffe with you up in front of the group. Would you be willing to do that? It didn't look happy to him when uh, I said that. He seemed very nervous about this. So we talked for a few moments, and I said, how about this? How about if I play your role, and you just have to sit there and coach me? He agreed to that. So now we're up in front of the group. The father is sitting here. I'm here playing the father's role. And then there's the son. And boy, for a public workshop of the kind that this was, this son took a big risk, because he opened up and said, Dad, my whole life, I have really wanted a closer connection with you, and I'm, I'm afraid that we're never going to develop it. And I want that more than anything in the world, and it's frustrating that I don't know how to bring it about. And like, it's really scary for me to have said that just now. I'd like you to tell me how you feel. And so I respond as the father and say, well, David, when you... When I see how much you want this, I feel very touched and very moved because I want the same thing. But I am scared to death because I don't know how to do it. And I'm also afraid that I'm not going to be able to do it well enough and you'll get impatient and give up on me. And how do you feel when I say that? And now the son gets tears in his eyes and said, Dad, just this much is what I've wanted my whole life. So we had a couple more very powerful interchanges, and I turned to the father, and I said, how am I doing in your role? Good. <laughs> Real good. Oh. So then the audience started to speak up, and uh, they, had, they admired the young man for taking the risk to bring his father and to open up that way. They really admired the courage that he showed. And the father said, I admire it too. <laughs> but the son, unfortunately, couldn't hear it because there was so much noise in the room. So I waited for it to calm down. I said, David, did you hear what your father said just now? Did you say something, Dad? What was it? I said, I heard him say, I admire you for doing it too. Did you say that, Dad? And then the two got up and embraced. And I've never seen a more beautiful sight than the mother's face who was sitting in the front row. 
because she also came. She had wanted that, she said, more than anything in the world for 40 years, to see the two of them be able to connect in that way. But it does take some courage to open up and let the jackal know that, that we would like this because, you know, it's very easy for the jackal to hear criticism even though we're not expressing it. Jackal, you know, I'm, I'm really sad because I would like there to be a different quality in our communication. And I'd like to know how do you feel when I say that. You got a lot of nerve criticizing me and saying I don't know how to communicate. Well, I'm sad if it came across that way, Jackal, because I was really not trying to say anything about you. I was trying to just communicate about my feelings and needs. I'd like to try again. I'm really feeling disappointed because I would like there to be a different quality of connection. Could you tell me what you heard this time? Now you're telling me that I disappointed you. Well, I'm grateful for you taking this time to understand me, Jackal. I really don't want you to hear that you are the cause of my feeling. I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you and say you disappoint me or you have to do something about it. But I would just like a connection for you to hear my feelings and needs. <coughs> I'm feeling frustrated because I would like there to be a different quality of connection between us. Could you tell me that back, please? You feel disappointed. Yeah. Because... Now you can see smoke coming out of the jackal's ears, you see. <laughs> this is not easy to shift and not hear any criticism and not, not hear a guilt trip, but just to keep your attention on the other person. You're disappointed because you yeah. would like there to be a different quality of connection between us. I'm grateful to you for hearing that, jackal. I'd like you to tell me now if you still hear criticism in that. No, no, not that time. And I'd like now to know how you feel when I say that, Jackal. <coughs> it's difficult. <coughs> see, Jackals love statements that start with it or that, you see. Notice how little you give of yourself when you say it's difficult or that's difficult. But the giraffe knows the Jackal's trying, so the giraffe's going to loan the giraffe ears and hear the feelings even when they're not expressed. No, it's difficult. So are you worried that you won't be able to do it? Yeah, and, and that you'll get, you'll get impatient with me. So you're worried and you need some reassurance that, that I don't have like a time limit of when I want this. That's right. Yeah, well, I'm really glad. I can go at, at any pace that's comfortable, Jackal. It's just important to me to have heard that you really want this too. Yep. Yes? In this situation, the jackal said, I'm just not clever enough to, to put words on my feelings. I'm just not clever enough to put words on my feelings. So, Jackal, are you feeling discouraged uh, because you would like some help from me in knowing how to do it? No, I don't know if that's it, but notice as a giraffe, I just try to hear the possible feelings and needs behind any message. Somebody say, I'm not clever enough to, to put words on my feelings. It's, it's so terrible. you're saying that you're not a trained giraffe yet? Yes, or saying, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm, I don't believe enough in myself to, to be able to learn something new or whatever. It's, it's like this uh, wolf inside yourself telling yourself you're the stupid one. Ah, so you, oh, I'm glad you bring that out because we haven't talked yet about how to speak giraffe with our inner jackal. And in fact, they're probably the most uh, severe jackals we will ever have to deal with. First of all, they're so f much faster than these other jackals. See, these inner jackals, they speak and, with the speed of light. And they have been in there so long that oftentimes we're not even aware that we are jackling ourselves. <coughs> That's why giraffes love to have certain feelings. <coughs> giraffes love to have feelings like depression, and guilt. Now, why does a giraffe like to have those feelings? Because those feelings tell us jackals have infested our thinking, that we are jackling ourselves. 
we are telling ourselves that there's something wrong with us. And whenever we're doing that as a giraffe, we want to tame those inner jackals. Now, how do we tame an inner jackal? The same way that we tame an external jackal. So what have we been doing tonight? We have been seeing that no matter what message comes at you from another person, no matter how jackalish it sounds, it's simply an expression of feelings and unmet needs. So we put giraffe ears on, and we hear the feeling and the unmet need. We do the same thing with our internal jackals. Once we have identified them, we see what we're telling ourselves, we learn to translate that internal ju judgment into what are the feelings and needs that are being expressed through this self-judgment. And then you know what we find? The same thing we find with external jackals, that there are no jackals. Jackals are simply giraffes with a language problem, as I said earlier this evening. Likewise, these internal messages that keep eating out our soul and our morale, if we really hear the life energy being expressed behind that message, we find out that it's a very loving message. We don't feel bad about ourselves at all. Let me show you how that works. I was doing some work in a workshop like this one evening on a relationship with a woman and her husband. And another woman who was watching, she just went like this. And I could tell from the look on her face she was having a serious case of internal jackals. <laughs> and I said to her, what, what, would you mind sharing what's going on in you? Oh, she says, I see now why I had the divorce that I did. I was been blaming the husband, but now I see it was really my fault. Well, see, now we know that she's beset with jackals because she has that word fault in her consciousness, you see. When we think in a jackal way, there always has to be fault, blame, you see. So I said, I'd really like to show you how to translate your inner jackal into giraffe. She says, I'd like to too. I just feel terrible feeling so bad about either angry at him or guilty about my role in it. So when you say it was all your fault, you should have known better how to communicate. What is the feeling and need behind that? Well, I should have behaved differently. Now that's a should. That's still an internal jackal. What is that jackal, that internal jackal saying when it says you should have behaved differently? Well, I'm sad, yeah. Because? Because I should have. Nope, stop. Not should have. What would you have liked? I really would have liked to have known then what I'm learning today. And how do you feel when you say that? Different. Yeah, because now you're in touch with the life energy behind your message. You're really hearing what you feel and need. You're sad. You would have liked to have known this then. But notice how different that is than thinking there's something wrong with you, that you should have known better. Notice that when we're in touch with our feelings and needs, that motivates us to do something about the needs. But when all that goes on in our head is should have and what's wrong with you, that doesn't help us learn from the situation. That doesn't mobilize us to change. We just can keep beating ourselves up for years until we tame those inner jackals, which always means to get connected to the life energy behind them. Who's got another jackal for us to tame this evening? Then let me show you another part of giraffe. Let me show you how to say and hear thank you in giraffe. If you have these ears on, I predict that on about your second or third day that you have these ears on, it'll occur to you what all of a sudden hit me one day, that human beings are only saying at any time one of two things. That's all human beings are ever saying. Can you guess what these two things are that human beings are saying? Please and thank you. 
That's all I'm convinced that human beings are ever communicating. Now, certainly jackal-speaking people say please in a funny way. Like here is a jackal-speaking person saying please. The problem with you is, what a tragic way of saying please that when somebody's behaving in a way that is not in harmony with your needs, instead of having a language that helps to clearly communicate what's going on inside in a way that stimulates compassion, <coughs> cooperation, how tragic to be taught to say please in the form of judgment and criticism. Because unless the person that you're saying it to has these ears, they don't hear the please. They don't hear the pain. They don't hear the unmet needs. They hear it as an attack and then attack back, and we all know where that goes. So tonight we have been focusing largely on this message, how to say please in giraffe, because I started this off saying I ask you to think of a jackal who was behaving in a way that you weren't happy with. But now let's look at the other message, how to say and hear thank you in giraffe. First, let's see how a jackal says thank you. You did a very good job. You are a very kind person. Can you see why that's jackal? Why is that jackal? Yeah. It's a judgment, exactly. <coughs> Positive judgments, praise, compliments are just as much jackal as criticism. But it works. What do you mean it works, Jack? <laughs> well, I'm a jackal manager. I just returned from some management training. They taught us that if you give a praise and compliments to employees every day, they work harder. Yes, Jackal, I'm aware of that research, and it's accurate. They do, for a while, until they sense the manipulation in it. And then, notice, Jackal, that even ruins a message as beautiful as thank you when people need to start worrying, is this being said to get something from me? So that's how jackals give appreciation in terms of judgment. But notice that whenever we use a positive judgment, we bring into our consciousness the negative. The two always go together. If you think there's such a thing as a kind person, then you think there's such a thing as an unkind person. If you think there's such a thing as a normal person, then you think there's such a thing as an abnormal person. So you fill your consciousness with judgments. And for every judgment like that that we carry in our consciousness, life is hell. Because it, it involves judging and being judged. But as giraffes, I hope by now I have convinced you that all judgments are simply tragic expressions of needs, values. We can be more honest by saying, I would like, than by saying to the other person, you're wrong. That's inappropriate. <laughs> so how does a giraffe say thank you? First of all, the giraffe only says thank you when the motives are to celebrate. There's no attempt to get something back from the other person. Now, what do we do to say the appreciation in giraffe? <clears throat> we say three things. We want to make three things very clear to the other person. These three things. Almost the same as the thank you, but it's a little different because now what we are observing is something that the person has done that is making life more wonderful for us. Whereas when we say please, what we are telling the person is something they're doing that is detracting from our enjoyment of life. So we start with a clear observation, and now we express a feeling, but now it's going to be a pleasurable feeling. Whereas when we say please, we're expressing painful kinds of feelings. And third, now we're going to tell what need of ours has been fulfilled by the other person's actions. Whereas when we say please, we say what need of ours has not been fulfilled. Let me give you an example of what this sounds like. I was in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, 
And at the end of a workshop, a woman comes up to me and she says, you're brilliant. I said, it doesn't help. She says, what do you mean? I said, I have been called a lot of names in my life. I've never learned by being told what I am. I'm guessing you want to give me an appreciation. She said, yeah, and I'd like to receive it. But there, I'm not getting the information that I'd need to really enjoy your thank you. Well, what do you want me to tell you? Well, rather than you telling me what I am, could you tell me what I've done that's made life more wonderful for you? Oh, you're so intelligent. Doesn't help. Doesn't help. That's still an analysis. I really need to know, what did I do? Now, that was not easy for this woman to do, because she was a jackal-speaking person. But she thanked me afterwards for pushing her on this, because she better appreciated her own appreciation when she really did get clear what it was that she was appreciating. It turned out that it was two things I had said. She had written them down in a notebook. She had underlined them and starred, put a star by it. So already, just being real clear about what I had done that she would observe, already I got more out of the appreciation than the vague judgment, you're brilliant or you're so intelligent. Now, I said to the woman, now that I see what behavior on my part you're reacting to, I'd like to know, how do you feel about my having said that? She said, I feel so relieved and hopeful. Oh, yeah, I hear feelings in those two words. Now I knew what she was feeling. And third, I said, and what need of yours was fulfilled by my having said that? She said, I have this 18-year-old son that I've never been able to communicate with. And I have just been desperately searching for any kind of direction that would help me connect with him. And those two things you said gave me the direction I've been needing. Well, now I could feel wonderful about her appreciation because I could see the three things that I need to see, that I think anybody needs to see to really benefit by an appreciation, to clearly see what we have done that has enriched another person's life to get some consciousness of what feelings are going on in that person as a result of it, to see clearly what needs have been fulfilled through our actions. Now, of course, it's easy to be a lazy giraffe. How does a lazy giraffe say thank you? Thank you. <laughs> of course, in the course of a day's time, uh, we may choose as a giraffe to be a lazy giraffe much of the time, to just say thank you for this or that. But giraffes want to be, have the ability for those things which really have touched us as people, that we really feel deeply about, that other people often don't really understand how much they have given to us. Then is when we might want to express the appreciation in this more classical giraffe way. Now, how does a giraffe and a jackal receive appreciation? Here again, we see some radical differences. Watch how a jackal receives appreciation. Jackal, I was very, I'm very grateful that you offered me the ride last night. I was really wanting to get home quickly because I wasn't feeling very well. Ah, it's nothing. <laughs> see, jackals always have to deny that there's anything of value within them. So they can't stand to hear appreciation. If you really want to make a, a jackal squirm, show it some love or appreciation. Why would a jackal get so nervous being shown appreciation? Incidentally, my favorite jackal of all, they, they almost all communicate the same way, like in French, uh, de rien, or in Spanish, nada. My favorite is Swedish, ash. <laughs> but they, they all say the same message, ah, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. You know why? Because jackals have an idea in their head which is at the base of much of their misery. Jackals believe that you deserve things. See, you either deserve to be rewarded or you deserve to be punished. So if you say that you've appreciated something they've done, they wonder whether they deserved it. <coughs> you see how tragic to spend time thinking about whether you deserve it or not. Now, where that concept of deserve really gets devastating is when we start to believe that we're smart enough to know who deserves
to be punished for what they've done. But the opposite is also painful, to believe that you deserve to be rewarded. See, that's because jackals don't have a concept of giving and receiving. In the jackal mind, everything has to be bought and sold. That means you have to decide what's worth what. So right away, they get something appreciative said to them, and they wonder, did I deserve that? Or now what do I have to do to earn that? Or what's this person trying to get from me? How sad to live in such a world where you just can't enjoy the appreciation. By contrast, a giraffe knows you receive the appreciation the same as you receive any message, with empathy. You just hear these three things. You just hear what you've done, how the other person feels, how their needs have been fulfilled. You don't necessarily have to say anything, but you show in your eyes that you took it in and were nurtured by the appreciation. So anybody have any questions about how to say or hear thank you in giraffe? Would somebody like to practice expressing giraffe to somebody in your family or somebody in your workplace that has done something and you haven't expressed an appreciation to them yet? What? I didn't see. Yes, thank you. Let's pretend like I'm the giraffe. Um. Tell this giraffe, first of all, what the giraffe did that you want to appreciate. Uh, it's um, mostly to my child uh, when I want to um, um, tell my child uh, you have done something, you have done a uh, fine drawing or something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad, Mom, that you want to do that in another way because I can enjoy your appreciation far more if you evaluate my performance in giraffe rather than jackal because you sure don't want me to, to think, I hope, Mom, that that any authority knows what's right. I hope you're scared of that, Mom, teaching a child that authority knows what's a good drawing or what right answers are. So I'm glad that you want to evaluate me in a way that will help me respect authority but not give my power away to them. So yeah, let's learn from that, Mom. So what about the drawing did you like, Mom? Yes, it was very fine. No, that's, again, too gentle, Mom. That's a judgment. Can you be concrete? Did you, was it the colors? Was it the composition that you were reacting to? Was it, just what was it about the drawing that you observed that was in harmony with your values? I think more the act. Just that I did that, it? That, yes. Ah, see, just that is what we want to get clear, Mom. So just the fact that I initiated and did this drawing for you. That's what you want to appreciate, Mom. So how did you feel when I initiated this drawing? Uh, well, I was glad that you had a good time. So you were glad because you wanted me to enjoy myself? Yes. And anything else about that you, what, what, why you felt glad about it? You weren't touched because you wanted me to be thinking of you and to... What I'm saying, Mom, is that was it just that you were glad that you wanted me to enjoy myself, or did you also appreciate the fact that I wanted to do this for you? Um, yes. But what I want to say is I, I don't think it's good enough for me to say to my child, uh, well, it, it's a fine drawing. But see, we wouldn't say a fine drawing to anybody <coughs> no, but, because but as a giraffe it. we don't think there is such but, a thing. But I do it all the time. <laughs> and I, I know it's not good enough, but I don't know what to say because it's not a big child and I don't want to um, talk a lot about it. I just want to... I'm really glad. Let me show you some possibilities <laughs> and then you tell me if any of these come close. Yes. I'm really feeling glad that you did this drawing because I really wanted you to be able to participate with the others when they draw. Because maybe this is somebody that hasn't been doing anything, and he's just been sitting there. So it might, I might be feeling relieved and glad just because I wanted his participation. Then I would say that. 
Or if I like the drawing, I might say something like this. I really enjoyed all of these colors and how you put them together. That really kind of met a need that I have for a lot of liveliness in a drawing. But I would say that only if I meant it. But notice I'm not saying it was a good drawing. I'm telling the person what needs of mine were fulfilled by the drawing. That leaves the child open for the reality that another person can look at the same drawing and not like it at all. Because they can have different needs. Then that helps the child to decide for herself or himself what's their own values. So I let them benefit from my expertise, but I only express my appreciation in terms of my feelings and needs, not using words that imply I know what's fine, what's good, and so forth. Like when I work with teachers at the university, it's very hard for me to get teachers to hear the difference between I like what you did. You know what they'll hear? I liked what you just did. Can you tell me what you heard? I got it right. Hold it, Jackal, I didn't say that. Well, what did you say? I said, I like it. I got it right. No, 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 no. I said, I like it. Oh, you like it? Yeah, and I hope you can hear a difference between that. Very hard, you see, after 14 years to get people to hear you as a human being when they have been trained to give authority the power to define what's right and what you have to do. But I'm very motivated to do that because I'm aware of the consequences of teaching people to give that authority, to give that power to authority. Such people, when they give all their power to authority and become obedient to authority, that's when I think we have the kind of violence in the world, not created by people who know how to be in touch with their own values, but people who have been trained from birth on to believe that somebody with a title knows what's right. And they don't use, learn to use their own valuing system to help them decide for themselves what will serve life the best. So what else can I say about giraffe in the time remaining? Yes? I feel a bit confused because each time you say I'm disappointed, I hear, I hear it with jackal ears. Yeah, yeah. So we would have to do some practice with, like I do with my students so that you could just hear, I'm disappointed because I would have liked to have had more color in it. Can you tell me what you heard? That it was a poor drawing. Now let's try again, Jackal. I just want you to hear my feelings and needs. I feel disappointed. I would have liked to have had more color. I'm sorry. I didn't want to disappoint you. Hold it, Jackal. I didn't say you disappointed me. You can't disappoint me, Jackal. You can't hurt me or disappoint me or make me angry. What? No, no, no. I'm responsible for my own feelings, Jackal. I would like you to hear them. I don't want you to take responsibility for them. So I'm disappointed. I would have liked more color. So you're disappointed? Yeah. Because I did a bad job. <laughs> no, not quite, Jackal. What are my needs? You would have liked more color. Thank you, Jackal. That's just what I need, is just for you to hear that. So that means I, sh I, I have to change the drawing. I would hope you don't hear my needs as a demand, Jackal. I hope you just hear it as my values. Now I'd like to know, what do you feel? What do you need? You know, I went to school for 21 years. I can't recall any teacher ever asking me those two questions. What do you feel? What do you need? It wasn't necessary to get a doctor's degree in psychology <laughs> to know what I was feeling or what I was needing. I remember for the first time when I went to and presented giraffe to a group of my colleagues to suggest that I was so disappointed with the way I was taught to think as a professional and how now I was trying to bring my own feelings and needs into my counseling, not analyzing what's wrong with the other person, but to try to express my feelings and needs. And I was explaining how much more my, the people coming to see me seemed to benefit by that. So one woman psychiatrist got very upset. and She said, Dr. Rosenberg, don't you see what you're doing? You're allowing your narcissism to interfere with your ability as a psychotherapist. <laughs> a gentleman rises in my defense and says to her, don't you see what you're doing? You're projecting your narcissism onto this man. 
Those are the healers in a jackal society. Scary? So how do we get good at giraffe? Let me suggest three things that seem to be necessary for the people that I've worked with to help them keep improving on their ability as a giraffe. The first, and for me the most important, is real consciousness daily about our own values. That is, how do we want to live? Unless we are highly conscious of that, unless we answer that question for ourselves, then we're likely to get easily swept along in whatever game the culture around us is playing. So each day, for myself, it's very important for me to start each day raising my consciousness about how do I want to live? How do I want to manifest that in my moment-by-moment -moment encounters with other people? So the more time people take each day to begin with a consciousness of how they want to be, I find that that's probably the single most thing in helping them become better giraffe speakers. Second, after consciousness about our values. Second, practice, practice, practice. And this means, again, learning when we're not able to do it. When we're not able to speak giraffe, we catch ourselves turning into a jackal, make a note of it, and when we have some peace and quiet later on in the day, use it as an exercise to ask ourselves, now what was this other person feeling and needing that I wasn't able to hear at the time? How could I have expressed my own feelings and needs in a more open, vulnerable way than I did? In this way, every error that we make becomes a learning opportunity. And the third thing that helps immensely in becoming a better giraffe speak speaker is to be a member in a giraffe community. And by that I mean a group of people who share the same values, and who also want to learn how to communicate in a way that makes it possible for us to manifest these values. In areas where I go where I see people forming such supportive communities, it's amazing how well they teach each other giraffe. Also, we need to work on nonverbal messages. Silence probably freaks out more baby giraffes than anything else. Jackals use silence as a very a vicious message when they know that other people uh, project all kinds of things onto the silence. So we need to learn how to put on giraffe ears when, when other people are silent. One time I was in a very professional setting working with some managers in a department in a large corporation where feelings aren't usually expressed. And I can't remember what I got so emotional about, but I got very emotional. I even started to cry. And then I looked up and I saw the most horrible jackal message I could ever imagine. The boss of this organization gave me this nonverbal message. And for about four or five seconds, I just suffered immensely because I put on these ears. And because of that nonverbal message, you know what I started to think for a few moments? Uh-oh, what's wrong with me for crying? See, I went from his message, nonverbal message, immediately to what's wrong with me. But my, my terrible feelings told me what I had on there, and I quick shifted, and I put on my giraffe ears, and I looked at him and said, are you feeling disgusted because you'd like somebody more in control of his feelings to be running this meeting? Now, if he had said yes, what's wrong with that? It doesn't say anything about me. That's just telling me about his feelings, and his values. But he didn't say yes. He said, no, no. I was just thinking how my wife wishes I could cry. And then to my total surprise, he starts to open up, and he confides in the group that he was in the middle of a divorce process at that moment. And he says, my wife says it's like living with stone to be around me. So what he was feeling was sadness. Sadness because he really wanted to have more access to his feelings. But if I hadn't put on these ears, I could have left that situation thinking there was something wrong with me for feeling what I was feeling. (laughs) 
My wife still can't believe I wear those things in public. <laughs> Notice when we speak giraffe and we have those silly looking things on. Moment by moment, our consciousness is on the green area there, the green representing life. With giraffe ears and a giraffe tongue, we're only focusing our attention on life, the quality of life in us, the quality of life in others. We're only focused on what can be done to make life richer for one another. Why would human beings ever want to have the focus of their attention in any other place than on life and opportunities to enrich life? Reach out to life Like leaves to sun Like plants to rain Like birds to grain out to life so many times in so many ways we're afraid to give afraid to live so many times now let's celebrate the joys of life each little breath from birth to death let's celebrate reach out to life like leaves to sun like plants to rain like birds to grain reach out to life I feel so sentenced by your words I feel so judged and sent away Before I go I'd like to know Is that what you meant to say Before I rise to my defense Before I speak in hurt or fear before I build that wall of words Tell me, did I really hear? Words are windows or they're walls They sentence us or set us free At the time that this song was written, I didn't know how to receive that I could matter a lot to a person without starting to get nervous about it. So this song helped a lot. It's a song called When I Come Gently. When I come gently to you, I want you to see not to get myself from you it's just to give you me i know that you can't give me me no matter what you do and all i ever want from you is you i know your fear of fences your pain from prison's past I'm not the first to sense it And likely not the last The hawk within your heart's not bound To earth by fence of mine Unless you aren't aware That you can fly When I come gently to you I want you to know I come not to trespass your space I want to touch and grow and when your space and my space meet each is not less but more we make our space that wasn't space before 
I come gently to you I want you to see It's not to get myself from you It's just to give you me I know that you can't give me me No matter what you do And all I ever want from you is you